Good evening. We, uh, some people uh, put on their glasses to read. I take mine off in order to read. Uh, we're indeed fortunate, actually, to have Sasha uh, holokow saransky uh, here to speak to us at uh, this seminar. Uh, I met Sasha at a as a matter of fact, at a seminar at the Center for International Security and Cooperation here at Stanford a few years ago. And um, when, uh, after he visited to, uh, when he was visiting to, after publishing his book, and it's a pleasure to see him again and to introduce him on behalf of uh, Professor Abbas Milani, who's the, the director of the Iranian Studies Program, who, uh, because of a previous commitment, could not be here tonight. Uh, Sasha is an editor at the New York Times op-ed page. He was a senior editor at Foreign Affairs from 2007 to 2011 and holds a doctorate in modern history from Oxford University where he was a Rhodes Scholar from 2003 to 2006. His writing has appeared in the American Prospect, the Boston Globe, the International Herald Tribune, the New Republic, and Newsweek. His book, The Unspoken Alliance, oh, I should, I should add, has, has been widely acclaimed by publications on the left, on the right, and in the center. So he's got a, a very broad, uh, he's had a very broad audience. Uh, and I have to say that uh, although there have been many books written about Israel since its founding in 1948, Few of them, as far as I'm concerned, uh, match the level of scholarship, balance, and fairness that are displayed by Sasha uh, in his uh, book, The Unspoken Alliance. So uh, he will be speaking about his book, and I believe he will have a few comments to make since this is, there's a, this is part of an Iranian studies program. So he'll say something about Iran as part of his talk. Uh, he will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then there will be time for a Q&A. So with that, uh, please welcome Sasha polkow saransky Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm not sure I will actually need the microphone. Um, can you hear me in the back if I turn it away? Uh, is that OK? Yeah? OK. Um, so uh, thanks, Len, for, for the intro. And, and as Len said, uh, I'm, I'm not an Iran expert. Uh, so um, I hope you could sort of keep that in mind uh, throughout the talk. Um, Dr. Milani invited me uh, to talk about the book. And I do think that there are some uh, lessons that um, can be drawn uh, from, from the Israeli-South African um, episodes that, that I detail in the book. And um, I'm hoping that perhaps we can discuss that more in the, in the question and answer period. I will talk a little bit um, about the history of that relationship between Israel and South Africa with a focus on issues of proliferation and also of isolation uh, in the international system, which of course was a challenge um, for both of those countries um, in the period that I studied, which was roughly from the 1960s until 1994 and the transition to democracy uh, in South Africa. Um, so uh, some of the questions that, that I'd like to address are what were Israel's military ties um, with pre-revolutionary Iran and what were Israel's ties with South Africa during that era and what motivated these relationships. And what interests me in particular is how isolation within the international system uh, affected decision making by Israeli and South African officials with um, specific regard to their military and, and nuclear programs. And then also what impacted sanctions uh, against both countries over those years and what impacted estrangement um, from the international community at large have, have on their policy making. Um, so while I may not draw any explicit conclusions about uh, what we might read into this um, with regard to the current situation in Iran, I mean, that is something that uh, is worth discussing, I think, um, after looking at, at this case study. So let me begin with just a bit of a historical overview of uh, the relationship between Israel and South Africa. Um, it's something that hasn't been uh, written about a whole lot. Um, 
and what I was trying to do with this book was to sort of delve into it, um, going back to the 60s and looking at an era when Israel was actually quite hostile towards South Africa. Um, and so fr from its founding and into the early 1960s, the Israeli government had uh, a, a very negative attitude towards the apartheid regime in South Africa. And Israeli leaders from Ben-Gurion himself up through Golda Meir were very vocal uh, in international settings at the UN, uh, on visits to newly independent African states. Um, they were very, very critical of South Africa. And um, Golda Meir, uh, in, in the late 50s, um, I quote from her here, she went to Liberia and uh, various other West African countries and she said, like them we had shaken off foreign rule, like them we had to learn for ourselves how to reclaim the land, how to increase the yields of our crops, how to irrigate, how to raise poultry, how to live together and how to defend ourselves. And she likened the, the struggle of post-independence African states to what Israel had gone through in its early days. And there was a real sense of affinity during that era um, between these newly independent nations and Israel. Um, this started to change around the time of the Six Day War and the change was really cemented around the time of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And what happened during that six year period uh, is you saw a new generation of leaders uh, coming to power in Israel um, and real politique was governing decision making much more than this sort of idealistic affinity uh, with the, the newly independent African states. And so this wasn't necessarily uh, a party line issue or an ideological issue within the Israeli political system. Some of the new uh, thinking came from people like Shimon Peres within the Labour Party, Moshe Dayan. They were promoting uh, a much more security centric view of uh, Israel's foreign relations and these small and, and not particularly powerful uh, African countries that Israel had been very friendly with in the 1960s were not part of that equation. Uh, and what happens uh, after the Yom Kippur War is that um, the, the Israelis across the political spectrum and, and in the press as well uh, start to feel betrayed and abandoned by some of these previously um, allied countries in Africa. And what, what happened in 1973 is most of these states that had been very friendly with Israel during Golda Meir's time, um, and you know she was still in power during this transition, but the, the underlings and the defense ministry and, and people in the foreign ministry were starting to see this as a worthless relationship in some ways, and they started to turn toward South Africa, uh, which presented Israel with uh, a lot of opportunities. And, and I'll, I'll go through that um, in, in some detail because it's, it's not uh, always self-evident, but what Israel was really after uh, in the wake of the Yom Kippur War was a way to rebuild the economy uh, and the defense industry in Israel was, was seen as an opportunity. So Shimon Peres, who was very young as a defense minister at the time, started to reach out uh, to new potential allies. And despite this history of overt criticism of apartheid in South Africa, that, uh, that was set aside uh, in the interest of, of financial benefit and also rebuilding of the economy and the Israeli defense industry w was a powerful force and South Africa at this time was extremely isolated within the international system. Um, the US in, in the early 70s was still supplying South Africa with some arms. France and Italy and West Germany were, were also still supplying a bit but everything was diminishing. Um, and Israel at that time needed new export markets in order to rebuild its defense industry after the war and in order to rebuild the economy. And so what you saw during 1974 and 1975 were a series of high-level, extremely secretive meetings between Shimon Peres as Israel's defense minister and P.W. Bota, who was then South Africa's defense minister. Um, and these meetings took place primarily in Switzerland, but in a variety of other um, international locations. And um, they discussed everything from ammunition, tank sales, bombs. They also discussed uh, a missile system. Um, and this 
1974, 1975, Israel's nuclear capability uh, is already known to the United States at that point and, and operational, according to most experts, on, on the Israeli program. And South Africa was developing its own nuclear weapons program during this era. Uh, and they had not quite uh, reached the final stages of it, but they were beginning to prepare uh, for underground tests and they were also trying to keep the secret from the United States which had been a quasi ally for South Africa um, in the early 1970s as it was fighting uh, wars on its borders there were some arms supplies still coming from the US and any sign of nuclear proliferation from an ally like South Africa could have undermined all of that so so what you see in 1974 and 1975 is the beginning of a high-level relationship that is almost uh, entirely premised on arms sales. And uh, what Israel is getting from this is a boon for its economy, uh, rebuilding of its defense industry, and South Africa is paying a premium to get arms that it can't get anywhere else uh, when it's becoming increasingly isolated, especially after the Portuguese colonies on, on South Africa's borders uh, became independent and wars began on the Angolan border. Uh, the Mozambican border, etc. And so South Africa was desperate to buy whatever it could from anyone, and by the mid-1970s, Israel was one of the only really enthusiastically willing sellers. And by the late 1970s, they were the only seller of certain, uh, certain military hardware. And so uh, what's most significant um, for our purposes today uh, in these talks was, was the discussion of of the Jericho missile, um, which uh, South Africa expressed an interest in uh, and Israel uh, discussed as, as something that they were willing to sell. And this was a nuclear capable system. It wasn't being sold off the shelf with nuclear warheads, but there were high level discussions uh, in which the South Africans expressed an interest in that and um, they perceived the, the Israeli uh, offer on the table as something that might one day include um, you know, uh, a nuclear-tipped missile. And this is relevant because uh, Israel, prior to the revolution in Iran, had a similar discussion um, and a similar relationship in the field of ballistic missiles. Um, and I'll read to you um, just a little bit from uh, a 1986 report um, from the New York Times when documents from, from the Shah's era uh, were revealed um, and published in, in Iran. And um, what they found was that in 1977, uh, Israeli officials were offering the Iranians uh, a very similar deal to what I just described uh, in South Africa. So basically, uh, in 1974 and 1975, these discussions are taking place with the South Africans. In 77, uh, they're taking place with Iran. And uh, according to this report, for the Israelis, the deal offered a guaranteed oil supply from Iran, as well as financing for advanced military research. Um, and in the, in the documents that were published, uh, General Ezer Weizmann said you must have, was telling the Iranian generals, you must have a ground-to-ground -ground missile. A country like yours with F-14s, with so many F-4s, with the problems surrounding you, with a good missile force, a clever and wise one. Um, and one of the Iranian generals was actually able to witness the firing uh, of a missile during a visit to Israel. Um, and during these discussions, they had a very similar uh, conversation to what occurred between Perez and Bota in South Africa. And having read the transcripts of, of the Israeli-South African discussions in 74, 75, I was struck by this because in the transcripts of the Israeli-Iranian discussions from 77, uh, the Israeli general again say, says, quote, all missiles can carry an atomic head, all missiles can carry a conventional head. Uh, and then um, the Iranians uh, describe this as uh, that, that the main reluctance on the part of the Israelis was American sensitivity to the introduction of these kinds of dual-use missiles uh, that they were talking about cooperating on. Again, this is in 1977, uh, and the worry was that if, if the U.S. found out about it, um, they would see this as, as a case of its allies engaging in proliferation, and it might jeopardize the relationship with the U.S. Um, one other point um, about these discussions between Israel and Iran in 77, um, 
In the wake of, of these conversations, a team of, of experts in Iran began to work on a missile assembly plant and also a testing range uh, near Rafsanjan where missiles could be fired 300 miles north into the desert or south into the Gulf of Oman. Um, the testing range is significant because the exact same thing happened on the south coast of South Africa in the early 1980s. The intervening event, of course, is 79 in Iran. And so what interests me about this moment is that Israel was clearly trying to sell some of its advanced and very desirable technology to new partners in order to revive its defense industry. And when one of those partners ceased to be an option, uh, for political reasons, they turned uh, very sharply in the other direction towards South Africa. And the plan that, that I was just describing um, that was envisioned with Iran was executed almost to the letter in South Africa between 1979 and 1989. Um, so let me just describe uh, how that happened um, and give you some of the details. In 1979, in March, so uh, just one month after Khomeini comes back to Iran, um, the Israelis invite a leading South African general to Tel Aviv and take him to a secret uh, military testing range on the coast where they fire the newest version of the Jericho missile in order to show it to the South Africans. Um, and so what you see is them executing a plan that was already in the works. and. The, the desire when they were talking to the Iranians was uh, to find some sort of joint financing for a very expensive project. Um, and South Africa was able to offer that as well, not in the form of oil supplies, which is what Israel had hoped to get from Iran, but instead uh, co-financing of, of defense projects. South Africa had uh, mineral riches, um, and one of the ongoing relationships at this point between Israel and South Africa that actually dates back to the 1960s was uranium supplies. Um, South Africa has a huge amount uh, of, of yellow cake uranium. Um, it's usually a byproduct of the gold mines in South Africa. And from 1961 onward, uh, South Africa had been shipping this to Israel. And one of the things that, that I uncovered during my research is that these stockpiles uh, of yellow cake which were shipped from South Africa to Israel from 61 until 76 were under bilateral safeguards. So the South African government had sent members of its Atomic Energy Commission every year to inspect uh, these drums of yellow cake that were in Israel and they were kept under lock and key and the South Africans were able to verify that they were not being used for military purposes uh, and they were therefore compliant. Um, it was a bilateral safeguard. It wasn't supervised by the IAEA, uh, but significant in that uh, they had agreed to this and the Israelis uh, didn't do anything with it until 1976. What happened in 1976 is uh, the South African Minister of Mines was sent to Israel uh, and it was billed in the press as uh, an exchange of um, thoughts on new mining ventures and, and these sorts of things. But uh, if you look at the documents surrounding the visit, and I also interviewed the, the man who made the visit, the, the Minister of Mines in South Africa before he passed away a few years ago, um, he met with Prime Minister Rabin, Defense Minister Perez, the head of the Israeli Atomic Energy Commission, various other very high level officials and generals. Um, and he claims that the, the purpose of the visit was actually to formally lift the safeguards that had been placed on the South African supply of uranium over that 15-year period to Israel. Um, what happened to it, whether it ended up in Dimona, that is something that I'm not able to prove uh, with the documents that I have, but the claim of the South African official who executed that deal, um, his claim is that the Israelis wanted to use it. Uh, and the safeguards were preventing that and his job uh, under orders from the South African Prime Minister in 1976, who had signed various uh, trade deals with, with Israel the same year, was to lift these safeguards. So that's a, a little uh, tangent, but explains some of the strategic interests involved in this relationship and what the Israelis were getting out of this in return, uh, apart from a new export market and a lot of revenue for the defense industry. Um, 
going back to this issue of, of the, uh, the Jericho missile, um, what happened in the, uh, the early 1980s is um, the test range was built uh, in this area of south coast of South Africa that is now a national park, but then it was a missile testing range. Um, and it's a sort of beautiful area along the sea where there are penguins on the beaches and white sand dunes everywhere. And um, used to be, you know, and it was a tourist attraction before this era, and now it is again. Um, and what happened there is, uh, the Israelis started to send large contingents of uh, scientists and, and defense research officials down there. Um, and their problem was they needed to create cover stories um, for everyone because suddenly in this little sort of fishing village on the south coast of South Africa, you had a lot of people speaking Hebrew in the only hotel that existed in the town. Um, and so some of the documents that, that I found in South Africa uh, involved the correspondence between the South African generals and their Israeli counterparts. Um, and they talk uh, in one of these documents uh, about cover stories. And they say, you know, um, the guy being sent to Israel, he must evaluate the credibility of existing cover stories and the ability of the new fa families to live up to them. And then there's a whole back and forth about people pre pretending to be math teachers and underwater researchers and other things so that they can, uh, they can have a, a viable cover story while they're in South Africa. Um, I think most people knew what was actually going on, given that the, the primary uh, activity there was um, a missile testing range, and these people were coming for three or four months each. But these are these are the kinds of, of things that pop up in the archives. And when you're doing this sort of research, um, it's never uh, fully apparent um, what's going on. And so you kind of have to find these little uh, sort of archival pearls that reveal something and then you go and interview the people who are in the documents, the people who are still alive, who are there, and then you piece the story together. Um, and so what happened at this test range went on throughout the 1980s um, and it was actually the first President Bush uh, in this country who put an end to it um, in 1989. And what happened is the in 1989 the CIA satellites picked up the plume uh, of a missile launch uh, off the south coast of South Africa. And keep in mind that this is three years after the United States government have, had imposed comprehensive sanctions against South Africa. So at this point, um, regardless of party affiliation in the US, um, there was a very strong anti-South African policy. Um, and Israel itself had imposed sanctions finally in 1987. Uh, they were not fully observed until the early 1990s, but on paper, um, Israel had followed suit under pressure from the United States. And so suddenly, there's a missile fired off the south coast of South Africa. It looks almost exactly like the trail or plume that comes, that's known to be an Israeli Jericho launch. Uh, and so all the analysts in Washington say, um, you know, this is clearly uh, an Israeli test launch or a test launch of a South African technology that, um, that has been developed from, from Israeli technology or jointly with. And so there was a reprimand from the White House. Um, and in 1989, they began to quietly shut down this whole missile program, which was really the, uh, the end result of something that had started in discussions between Israel and Iran in, in the 70s. And um, the aftermath of that in South Africa was interesting because a lot of the scientists involved insisted that it was actually a space launch vehicle and they wanted to maintain it. And they said, this is gonna be damaging to the South African economy, but uh, the Americans and the Brits and, and even the Israelis to some extent in the late 1980s were reluctant to let South Africa hold on to that technology because uh, change was on the horizon in South Africa by 1989 and certainly by 1990 when Mandela was released and there was a real fear uh, in Israel but also in London and Washington that uh, the successor government in South Africa, no one really knew um, what Mandela was going to be like when he came to power and there was still a lot of hostility um, in the defense and intelligence establishments of these countries toward the ANC because they had after all been friends with the Castros and the Qaddafis of the world and there was a fear that if this uh, nuclear technology and uh, conventional long-range missile technology fell into the hands of that 
government, um, no one knew where, where it might end up after that. So that was another um, sort of more realist impulse uh, on the part of, of the Bush administration and others in, in trying to, to shut this down. Um, to switch gears a little bit now, one of the other angles uh, I said I'd talk about and, and that I find interesting in, in this relationship, and I think that also has a bearing on uh, debates uh, in the news today about Iran and the Iranian program and sanctions and additional sanctions and, and, and all of this, is, um, is what extent sanctions and threat, to, to what extent do sanctions and threats promote proliferation um, in countries that, that, that are on the verge uh, of, a pro, of a nuclear program? And let me preface this by saying the South African case was very, very different. Um, it was not nearly as much in the news as, as the Iranian case is today. Um, there also wasn't overt uh, you know, congressional intervention and pressure. But um, I think there is an interesting case study in that uh, South Africa actually accelerated its nuclear program after the Carter administration in the U.S., and this was in 77 roughly, um, started to, to really um, crack down and, uh, and let it be known that a South African nuclear weapon was unacceptable. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about uh, an episode that took place in 77, and it was, um, and I apologize for jumping back and forth historically, but um, since, you know, these are slightly different um, themes, uh, I, I'm going to jump back to 77 now. And, and what was going on at that moment is Washington had already cut off nuclear fuel, civilian nuclear fuel exports to South Africa for one of their research reactors. Uh, so there was already some worry in the State Department and in the White House that South Africa was moving towards a nuclear weapons capability. Um, and so that was the first incidence of pressure. And then in 77, the IAEA removed South Africa from its board of governors. And South Africa had actually been a pretty uh, important part of the IAEA because it's a major uranium supplier. Um, so from, from the early days, uh, South Africa was part of that. And that seat was given to Egypt, which really infuriated the, the South African government. And then in 78, the US Congress passed the NPT, um, or the Nuclear Proliferation Act, and, and that halted nuclear exports to countries that didn't accept IAEA safeguards and inspections. Uh, and South Africa uh, was not accepting that, and so suddenly it was isolated much more than before. And in 78, Washington was trying to strong arm the South Africans into signing the NPT. And um, wh what you see in that era is it sort of has the opposite effect. Um, and some people in the Carter administration were worried about this. His, his ambassador, Andrew Young, to the UN at the time, who was a major critic of South Africa and the apartheid regime, said at the time, if you break the relationship altogether, there's no way to monitor. And uh, later, um, Valdo Stump, who was one of the nuclear scientists at the center of the, the South African program, uh, reflected back on this. And of course, he was one of the people behind the scenes who, who was actually working towards a, a nuclear weapons capability in the 70s. And in the 90s, he wrote, a point may be reached where political leverage is lost and the isolation becomes counterproductive, pushing the would-be proliferator toward full proliferation. And what happened in South Africa um, basically validates uh, that argument. In 77, uh, a group of scientists, including the one I just quoted, um, went out to the middle of the Kalahari Desert, to a very remote site called Vastrop, uh, and they started to make the preparations for an underground uh, nuclear test, and the Soviet spy satellite picked up um, certain images that bore all of the telltale signs of wiring and preparations for uh, the instruments that would measure an underground test. And um, in a rare moment of Cold War cooperation, this was shared with American intelligence, and uh, the CIA sent its own satellite over, um, and or its own uh, a satellite and a spy plane over this. Um, they did a flyover and they verified that this also seemed to be preparations um, for an underground test. And so what happened is uh, Carter um, 
vocally uh, denounced this to the South African government. The prime minister at the time was John Foster uh, in South Africa. And um, they basically shut everything down. And I interviewed some of these scientists later who were making all of these preparations. And they knew that they had been found out. They packed up. They took everything back to Pretoria. And everyone said the right things and made the right noises. And all of the press reports, if you go back um, in late 77 and look at, at what was being said, is yes, the Foster regime in South Africa has agreed to halt its nuclear program. Uh, President Carter is satisfied with this. Um, the Russians you know, made certain demands. The French and the British also got involved. Everyone made the right noises. And the assumption, uh, at least on the surface and, and in the press, was that the South African program had been shut down or put into a freeze when in fact what happened at that precise moment is that it was accelerated. Um, and one of the scientists who was there um, said uh, that, that that was a moment when the security agencies in South Africa and the Prime Minister himself um, said uh, this, is, this is where we have to take this underground and accelerate the program. And South Africa, depending on whose estimates you look at, got its nuclear weapons capability between 1979 and 1982. Um, so the two to three years immediately after um, this moment when, you know, both the superpowers discover um, that they're making preparations actually accelerates the program. And um, that year, uh, a man named Neil Barnard, who later became the head of South Africa's intelligence agency, was writing his PhD thesis on nuclear strategy uh, in South Africa. And he wrote in 1977, in the wake of this event, the acquisition of nuclear weapons will not necessarily isolate South Africa any further. And that was very much the policy that the government adopted and later appointed him um, to, to carry out. And so I think that it, it's, it's worth reflecting on um, how uh, intentions um, can actually, you know, that if the intention is to impose sanctions and halt something, um, in the South African case, it actually led to to the opposite effect. And I think that, you know, again, the, the Iran case is, is very different, um, but I think there's a larger lesson about uh, small powers and proliferation here um, that, uh, that it's worth bearing in mind. Um, a couple of other things, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, the uh, the other interesting element of, of this relationship is that uh, the, the U.S. and Israel had a bit of a falling out in, in 1975. Um, it's something that's often forgotten these days, but um, the Ford administration was conducting uh, shuttle diplomacy at uh, at that time, and, and Kissinger was going back and forth, uh, trying to resolve um, some of the remaining uh, issues from the Yom Kippur War and s the status of Sinai. And the U.S. government became very, very frustrated with the attitude of the Israelis, and they felt that they were stonewalling in negotiations. And so President Ford declared early in 1975 um, that he was going to, quote, reassess the U.S. relationship with Israel. Um, and it, it had a pretty profound impact on strategic thinking within the, the Israeli military. And one of the things that happened, um, and it was only you know, a period of a few months, and then everything was patched over and, and, and things were fine again. But w Rabin was prime minister at that point, and he used it politically, dom uh, domestically, uh, to grandstand a little bit and say, you know, we can we can go on our own. You know, the U.S. is an important ally, but um, you know, if if we have to seek others, we'll do so. And um, there are echoes of this, obviously, today, and 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 that's why I bring it up. And what happened is during this roughly six-month period. Um, the Israeli relationship with South Africa accelerated pretty dramatically, and this ties back to, to what I was talking about earlier, uh, these meetings between Shimon Peres and P.W. Bota. The, the later meetings um, took place sort of during this period, and um, one of the Israeli generals, if you just bear with me for a second here as I've messed up all of my papers, um, just going to find this quote from him from the middle of, of, of this period. Um, one of the South African 
defense officials was visiting Israel at this point. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that the South African official was later found out to be a Russian military intelligence spy. And the guy who was responsible for tipping off the Soviet satellite to fly over that test site. Um, in 1975, he, he was going to meet with Israeli generals uh, in his role as a South African defense official and also presumably to gather some information. Um, and the Israeli general Abrasha Tamir, who he met with, told him during this reassessment crisis uh, with President Ford that the country needed, quote, another leg to stand on if the United States ever left it out to dry again. Israel was looking for a nation that, quote, could invest enough in our projects so that they could be pursued independently. And that was a role that South Africa was able to provide. And over the years, as we've seen, especially in the case of the missile program and the test site, um, they were able to carry this out. Israel was able to get something that it desperately needed strategically, which was a large open space where uh, its technology could be tested without being detected. Uh, and the South Africans were able also to su supply financing um, and uh, an export market for the Israelis. So um, the, the notion of looking elsewhere for partners when under pressure, I think also ties in uh, with, with this idea of, of placing excessive pressure, which actually can drive uh, a country in the opposite direction of, of, of what uh, is intended. Um, in the Israeli case, of course, no one could actually replace the U.S. in its level of importance and its level of involvement, but um, it served a political purpose domestically, and uh, it did lead to the enhancement of ties with other potential allies. And at that, at that time, um, in 75, of course, Iran was still in the picture for the Israelis. Um, and that was part of... of what was called the strategy of the periphery for Israel, um, which in the 1970s, prior to the revolution in Iran, involved the Iranians, the Lebanese Christians, the Kurds, um, the Turks, pretty much any sort of non-Arab country or, or potential ally um, that, that Israel saw as, as someone that it could work with. Um, so uh, with that, I will um, leave it and, and open this up to questions. Uh, and feel free to, uh, to ask me about anything I've talked about or things that I've left out. Or um, uh, you can even ask me about uh, my day job at the New York Times. And I should say that as a disclaimer, what I've said here is purely personal and from my own research and you know, doesn't, doesn't reflect my day job at the Times. <laughs> Thank you. Either way, um, sure. What got you started in that line of research? Uh, well, uh, it's probably a pretty easy guess. I'm, uh, I have two South African Jewish parents, um, and I grew up in the States. Uh, it's something, my parents left in 73, came to Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, which is where I was born. And um, this wasn't something that was really talked about, per se. Um, it was something that, you know, my parents had been involved in the anti-apartheid movement uh, before leaving South Africa and, and later uh, in the U.S. And, you know, th there were hints of this. People knew that, that something was going on. Journalists were writing about it. But no one really had access to, um, to all of the information because it was all... It's still classified in Israel, and the South Africans uh, gave me a lot of documents that they probably shouldn't have. Uh, I, I later heard from some of the archivists. Um, and so it, uh, it was something I was curious about, obviously from, for personal reasons, um, and because I'd heard it mentioned, and it sounded sort of mysterious and important and, and under-researched. And uh, when I found myself looking for a PhD topic, uh, it, it seemed like something that could hold my attention for, for four years or more and, uh, you know, satisfy some of the sort of journalistic uh, curiosity within me as well. So that's the short answer. Yeah. Is there any evidence that the U.S. intelligence agency, agencies knew about the cooperation between Israel and South Africa during the period that Yes. Um, they knew some things, but they didn't know everything. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of interesting 
CIA documents that have been partially declassified that show that they were watching it quite closely. Um, I mentioned the one incident where, you know, during um, George H.W. Bush's administration, the satellite picked this up. They had been looking at this, but they didn't realize that the cooperation was quite so close. So there are some documents um, from 79 um, about an event that, that Len knows well, um, which was, and I imagine some of you have heard of, which was the, the so-called double flash over the South Atlantic, uh, which is when an American satellite picked up a double flash, which is the, the known sign of a nuclear detonation. Um, and uh, there was speculation and a pretty extensive CIA study of of who done it essentially because um, it happened sort of off the coast of the sort of south uh, east coast of South Africa. Um, there was initially speculation that the French might be testing something, that the Indians might be testing something, and it was quickly narrowed down to Israel or South Africa or the two of them. Um, and then there was quite a lot of uh, effort within the State Department to suppress uh, any. Um, I won't get too into this because that you could literally write a book on the, uh, on this topic, and and Len could talk about it with uh, much um, greater accuracy than I could. Uh, but it um, it would have made the U.S.'s non-proliferation policy look very bad if either one of its uh, allies had been secretly testing nuclear weapons um, without notifying it. And so that is the most extensive study by U.S. intelligence that I've seen. I'm, I imagine that there are many more that are still classified. Um, but they, from 79 on, they were aware that something was going on. Um, even in 77, they, you can see from the sanctions that were being imposed on the civilian uh, nuclear program in South Africa that I mentioned, that there was some worry that South Africa had an advanced scientific infrastructure and that they had an indigenous supply of raw materials uh, that could be used in the nuclear industry. So um, putting the pieces together, U.S. intelligence was worried. After 79, they became more worried. Um, there's some documents from the mid-80s showing that they're still watching, but um, what I was told by retired um, defense and, and intelligence officials in Washington is that during the Reagan administration, this was deprioritized. It wasn't cut off and they were still watching, but between 81 and 89, South Africa was not considered a prime proliferation threat. Um, they had reached nuclear weapons status at that point. Um, and rightly or wrongly, the Reagan administration saw them as less of a threat than some of the other potential proliferators out there. Um, and then you see after 89 in this missile test, uh, another wave of attention to it because they want to make sure that it's actually been shut down um, and that if South Africa still had any of this technology that they weren't going to export it um, to enemies of the U.S. So. The U.S. knew, but less than you would expect, is, is, is what I came away thinking, um, based on the documents I saw. Um, they were paying attention, but they were, uh, things were concealed well enough that uh, they didn't know everything. Yeah. Are you find that there were no tacit approval? Well, it's an, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I, that was one of my big questions going into to, to my research. Um, if there was tacit approval, I, I would say it was between 81 and 89. I don't know if I would go so far as to call it tacit approval. I think it was more um, turning a blind eye um, to something that had already... I don't, I don't think there would have been tacit approval during the development stage, um, regardless of whether a Democrat or Republican. I think that, you know, no one w it wouldn't have been in anyone's interest to let South Africa go nuclear under the U.S.'s nose if they had known. So the, the deception on the South African side was necessary, and I think they knew that. Um, but yeah, there, there's a case to be made that during the Reagan administration, uh, they turned a blind eye and, and should have paid more attention. Um, but I think in the earlier stages, even when South Africa was uh, you know, fighting in Angola and the, the Ford administration um, you know, in in 75 was still sending some weapons, uh, and then Congress sort of shut that down uh, with the Clark Amendment um, in 1975, which sort of stopped the, the funneling of weapons to South Africa's allies in Angola. That um, is another moment where some people would argue, okay, there's tacit approval of 
arming South Africa. Maybe they're looking the other way while the Israelis do it. Um, but then when Carter comes in, you see it move in the other direction, and there's actually like a real effort to, to crack down. So, so it, it goes back and forth, but um, I don't think it was uh, an intentional thing where the U.S. was letting Israel act as a proxy. Um, a lot of the, the earlier research on this, before I got these documents, especially from um, left-wing writers in the U.S., said, oh, Israel's just acting as a U.S. proxy. They're not an independent actor. And I strongly dispute that because everything that I discovered um, in the course of this research showed that, that Israel was very aware of what it was doing. It was doing it intentionally, and it was doing it for specific reasons that benefited its economy and, and you know, benefited it strategically. Regardless of, of the moral calculus involved in this, and I know that I haven't, haven't talked about that at all, um, and, and I'm happy to in, in questions, but Israel was an independent agent in this. They knew what they were doing, uh, and they were doing it for a reason, and they weren't just a passive US proxy, that's for sure. Uh, yes? Well, on that moral issue, did, did Israel ever kind of breathe a sigh of relief after the, the Iranian deal fell through, mm. the regime changed. Mm. I'm surprised there wasn't some reflection going, wow, that was a good thing we didn't sell them. <laughs> um, and then maybe we should consider who we sell them to. Yeah, sort of no, it's a very good question. Um, I imagine there was. Um, you came across no debate in your research. Um, no, and, and part of this, I mean, I, I imagine there definitely was, was and I didn't come across any documents. That's largely because Israel hasn't declassified anything on this. So my, you know, the, the archival record that I dealt with was entirely on the South African side, w with the exception of some US documents, right? So the declassified CIA stuff. The South Africans kept very meticulous records, which included all of their correspondence with the Israelis. So in the South African archives, you can find a lot of uh, materials on Israeli Defense Ministry letterhead, Israeli Foreign Ministry letterhead, and so on. And so you get uh, some sense of, of the bilateral relationship and the correspondence. Um, but uh, there, there's probably a very rich archive, I imagine, somewhere in Israel that's still under lock and key about how uh, Israeli defense officials reacted to, to the revolution and, and, um, and that particular issue of you know not having uh, sealed that deal on, on the Jericho missiles because I imagine um, there would have been a you know a real cost to that. I mean, obviously there was some contact afterwards, right, uh, between Israel and Iran and 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 um, all the ensuing scandals. But I imagine this particular case, um, yes, there's there was probably some relief and hopefully some historian someday will get a hold of those documents. Uh, yes. I wanted to ask about the um, applying pressure and getting counterintuitive or maybe mm. counter uh, expected results. Mm. And, and you mentioned that the case with Iran uh. Uh, was, was very different from the case mm. with South Africa. Mm. Can you talk about a little bit that, what the differences are mm. and whether you think, you know, to your estimate, that it's going to go or play the other way with Iran as opposed to South Africa? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, this this isn't my field of expertise, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, my sense is that, uh, you know, the the Iranian case has played out in the public eye for a very long time now, um, and so a lot of people are watching, both governments, um, journalists. You know, every round of talks now is sort of very closely monitored and commented on. None of that really happened. With, with South Africa, you know, they, they, they were doing it very secretively. And in a lot of ways, South Africa in the mid 70s was trying to emulate what Israel did in the mid 60s. And there was a lot of contact between them um, in this defense relationship. And, um, you know, Israel managed to build its program and get across the finish line under the nose of US inspections. Um, and Avner Cohen has documented this meticulously in, in his book, Israel and the Bomb. I mean, every single visit that the U.S. inspectors in the Kennedy era, the Johnson era, um, you know, going to, to Dimona and, I mean, you know, being told that, oh, you can't go there this weekend because it's Shabbat. And, I mean, you know, there, there were, I mean, he had, it's a book worth reading just because of the granular detail of, of each of these visits and how essentially Israel managed to, to cross the finish line. 
um, and then let it be known to the U.S. that they had, uh, and then it was a fait accompli. And so, in a way, I think the South Africans were trying to mimic what Israel did, and ironically, uh, I think Iran, um, you know, is probably looking at that case too. I can't really comment um, with with any knowledge on on what they're thinking at, at this particular moment, but I'm sure. Uh, you know, at, at earlier times um, in the saga of the Iranian program, um, you know, you look to historical examples of people who have succeeded, and um, you know, Israel and South Africa are two of those examples. And how did they do it? And um, you know, what was the, the what was the public debate like? What were the inspections like? And so, um, my sense is, um, based on you know my knowledge, which is purely um, from you know consuming media accounts and, and talking occasionally to, to people involved with the talks is that it's moved into a different stage at this point where um, there is a, where both sides see a potential strategic benefit from a deal. Um, I don't think that South Africa ever really thought that way. Um, when I talked to some of these scientists, the guys who were con setting up for that underground test, um, and you know, packed up everything, and then later became um, some of the lead scientists on actually building the first nuclear bomb in South Africa. Um, they said that you, the entire mentality within the South African program was to build a nuclear deterrent so that they could force Western intervention if South Africa was ever under mortal threat. Now, a lot of people don't accept this argument, um, but it's it's been advanced by a lot of people who were were key people within the South African program and don't really have an incentive today to make up stories about it. Um, the you know the people they were reporting to back then have, are no longer in power, and so and they say that the the thinking was you know we're not building a giant nuclear arsenal to start a war. We're not going to go and um, you know drop the bomb on Angola. Uh, it, it was seen as something that could be tested in order to provoke uh, Western intervention if there was ever, say, a full-scale uh, war on you know, the Angolan border, which was a real fear in South Africa in the 1970s. They'd go and test, uh, you know, successfully test a nuclear bomb out over the ocean somewhere, and the Brits and the Americans would say, oh, okay, they have it. They're signaling to us that they're willing to use it. We're going to now come in and intervene in a way that settles things down. That that's how the South Africans explain their strategy, um, and so I think it's different um, in that sense. I mean, sure, there's uh, I guess there there is a mentality among um, sort of threshold nuclear powers everywhere that you know if we cross the finish line suddenly everyone will respect us more um, and you saw that in South Africa too that especially after the 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 episode of being caught red-handed trying to stage a test they're like okay we're just gonna have to do it more secretively because Russia and the US took this seriously enough to cooperate with each other in the middle of the Cold War um, and shut this down. That means that what we're trying to do actually has real strategic value in the international system. And we, and, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, but these are things that I heard from policymakers in that era, and that's how they were thinking. So in that sense, I think, um, I think that's a common um, thought that, that probably goes through the mind of, of policymakers in any country w that's getting close. But I think what's different here is that, um, you know, you have a, an exceptionally uh, sort of hostile and sort of frozen relationship between the U.S. and Iran and a, a deal that could potentially unfreeze that and change things dramatically in all sorts of ways uh, for both countries. And that creates a different set of incentives than existed um, in the South African case or in the Israeli case. Um, yeah. For what it's worth, uh, if I recall correctly, you mentioned around 77 that yeah. the, the conversations between Israel and Iran sort of uh, fell off by the wayside. Mm. Uh, for what it's worth, in my recollection, mm. I don't exactly remember during which year of the Shah of Iran, yeah. um, it came to know that he, is, he has come down with a cancer. Right. So if it is, if mm. one was, if it is anywhere close to the year 77, that mm. might have some some impact where it might have had some impact on the calculus of the relationship between Israel and Iran. Just Interesting. Point. And I have no recollection, but, mm. but it's just a data point. 
And that the Israelis would have said, okay, he's on his way out. Uh, and, the, the, yeah. Actually, the information came as a result of the French uh, government. And mm. If I recall correctly, French mm. doctors were visiting the Shah. So that information mm. could easily have been passed on through the U.S. Mm. or through the French mm. to the Israelis. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question myself, if I can insert myself here. <laughs> uh, the, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the International Atomic Energy Agency did an investigation after... South Africa agreed to dismantle its mm. nuclear weapons mm. that showed that they were not in a position to actually test a device in, in 77. Mm. So that the uh, structure that they put up in the Kalahari Desert mm. and so forth was really for show mm. because they didn't have a nuclear device to set off. Right. And that... It was a cold test, right? That was... Well, yeah. they didn't have the, they just didn't have the, the thing put together mm. actually to actually set it off and create a nuclear explosion. Mm. So the uh, it was really intended, as I, I believe, to get the, the United States involved mm. and to show that they are serious about having a you know a nuclear weapons program. But they and they wanted to signal that in the hope of intervention in case of an attack, as you pointed mm. out. But they actually didn't have the bomb mm. at that point. It came later. Yeah, no, it definitely came later. The way it, the scientists described to me that it was sort of a preliminary, and and here you know. Uh, your mm, physicist's knowledge will be, uh, you know, uh, more useful than, than than mine as a historian. But that um, that it was a preliminary stage where they didn't have the um, the fissile material um, to actually stage a full-on test, but that they had um, sort of an advanced explosive that they wanted to to conduct measurements on and and that they were sort of putting underground and uh, well, they, they could have set off a TNT explosion yeah. I mean and you need you need uh, you know if you're going to have uh, an implosion device you yeah. need uh, you know you need the TNT in order to set off a nuclear explosion but they didn't have they didn't yeah. have the the ability to set up a nuclear right. at that point. Yeah, I mean, they usually point to 79 as the moment when right. when they actually had a full-fledged thing. I mean, they, you know, the, the, the people I interviewed described this as sort of a preliminary thing. They never said that in this case they were trying intentionally to get discovered. Um, so that's that's interesting. I mean, my, the, the way the story was told to me is that the Soviet spy, um, who I interviewed also, um, he lives very peacefully in South Africa in a sort of area where a lot of retired naval officers live, which is quite bizarre because they're the people he betrayed. And um, But, you know, he anyhow, uh, his name is Dieter Gerhardt. And he, um, yeah, so he... he was collecting information and he knew that something was going on in this desert and so he sort of released the coordinates and then the Soviets flew over. Um, again, you know, uh, this is all um, from his own account and, and from some documents. So it's, it's unclear um, exactly what the sort of catalyst for the discovery was. But the, the strategic argument that we want the West to notice and, and then intervene to save us is something that, that uh, I was always told um, in reference to sort of a full-fledged capability because they feared that they wouldn't be taken seriously until they really had it. And so if they just had a delivery system but they didn't have a nuclear warhead that no one would take them seriously. Um, and you know, a lot of them are very adamant that, oh no, we never would have used it. Um, we just wanted to you know, scare people into, into backing us in, in a moment of crisis. But now your question. Sorry. You, you mentioned that the sanction uh, kind of contributed that South Africa started to put uh, things underground. Yeah. Iran has already learned the lesson from beginning mm. from Syria and mm. all those, and they started from underground. Yeah. Now I'm wondering what sanction can contribute to the situation of Iran if it become mm. a stronger uh, sanction. What do you think? Well, I mean, my sense, and again, you know, this is not based on any extensive research, but just from, from following what's in the news, um, I think that the sanctions debate now has much less to do with sort of nuclear programs and nuclear strategy than just sort of standard 
diplomatic interaction and diplomacy and sort of how uh, how negotiations between allies who don't have a high level of trust actually tend to play out. Um, and I think that's sort of the model that, that we should be looking at is sort of other moments when enemies uh, or countries that, that lack trust have been in, put into high level negotiations. You know, the, some of the US Soviet negotiations in the 80s could be an example to look at. Um, and I think, you know, the sanctions versus further sanctions versus sanctions relief argument, I think, is really about trust and whether uh, moderates in Iran can stave off the pressure from hardliners and whether moderates in the U.S. can stave off pressure from hardliners by putting uh, a viable sounding deal on the table. And the risk then is that if there's a looming threat of further sanctions, and again, this goes, I think, for, for other situations where, where you're dealing with negotiations involving people who don't trust each other at all and also have no sort of real point of reference for successful negotiations in the last few decades, um, they might be scared away from the deal. And, you know, you look at like what happened yesterday, for instance, um, the Republican letter, um, you know, the impact of that, uh, I, I mean, I think most of the Iranian negotiators are already well aware of the risk and the fact that there's internal opposition in this country, but an overt uh, sort of statement that um, this might not be worth the paper it's signed on is, is not likely to enhance trust in a relationship where it's already lacking. And so I think that, um, you know, there, there are serious and respectable arguments um, coming from, you know, various sectors in this country about uh, you know, why um, the U.S. should be wary of Iranian promises and why sanctions are important. But I think that, you know, at the moment that, uh, that we're at right now, it, and if trust is, is the primary issue uh, holding up a deal, if you, if you believe that, then I think that threatening um, further sanctions is not likely to help and, it, and it's more likely to derail a deal in this situation. Um, so the question is, if the deal indeed derails, <clears throat> do you think Iran has the very goal to proceed on its own and develop this thing toward a, uh, toward a, uh, a bomb or near bomb situation? Maturity? I don't feel I can answer that um, based, on, based on what I know. I, I think that um, it would certainly be a risk. I mean, if it really blows up and, you know, trust is... It disappears completely and there's no hope for further negotiations, then uh, I imagine that everyone's going to go back to their corner and and start to think. And then it depends whether you believe Iranian assurances that they never wanted this for military purposes at all. Um, you know, you kind of go back to, to square one. I, I think that um, it could be a much riskier situation. That's my gut instinct. Uh, if if um, now, if, if there's no deal but negotiations continue, uh, then I think you know there there's still some promise. But I do think that there's a real risk in both places of uh, moderates who actually want some sort of deal, excuse me, losing credibility politically at home, and not just in Iran, right? Um, and I think that uh, then there is a risk that everyone goes back to the drawing board and reconsiders what their strategic priorities are, and you're in a situation where a deal is not even one of the viable options, and I, that strikes me as a riskier situation. You have to separate capability from intent. Uh, the Republicans, of course, are, are saying that there is the intent of the Red is to build the bomb. Uh, and maybe that's true, and maybe it isn't, but with, there's no unambiguous information about that. There is certainly a lot of information that they intend to have the capability to have to build a bomb, and in fact, they do. Uh, they they have the they are collecting the materials. They have the technology. They know how to do it. In fact, what people, what the press doesn't report, uh, although it should. I mean, it's not a secret that the, the Iranians were planning to have a nuclear weapon program when the Shah was in power and that, in fact, uh, we were going to 
inadvertently help him by allowing him to have a reprocessing plant if a, an agreement between the United States and Iran had proceeded at that point before he basically was toppled. Uh, and that plant would have allowed them to, to produce plutonium from, uh, from spent fuel from a, rea a research reactor, and from that you can, you can build a, a nuclear weapon. So that was a long time ago. That was over 30 years ago. Uh, so the Iranians have had a long time to think about this and to put scientists to work on this. They undoubtedly have the ability to build a nuclear weapon if they want to do it. The question is, do they really want to do it, as opposed to keeping this thing up in the air uh, uh, for whatever political benefit they think it gives them? And a footnote to that is in the, the Shah's era, there were also talks with South Africa because the Iranians were aware of the South African supply to Israel. Uh, and to my knowledge, no transaction ever took place, but the Shah's government expressed interest in obtaining yellow cake from South Africa in, in the early and mid 70s. Yeah. But also, a footnote uh, the mentality of the nation is very important, mm. I think. And uh, as my knowledge, <laughs> I think that Iranian. Iranians have dreamed for a long time, for mm. decades. Yeah. Uh, is their dream to have a uh, yeah. nuclear weapon because they want to be, come, be really the most powerful nation. Or, mm. uh, yeah, and I. As, as they have been 2,500 years ago, they dream about that. Yeah. Still. I think the pride issue is, is something you see in a lot of places. I mean, the South Africans certainly had that. There was tremendous pride among these scientists. and knowing that they had the infrastructure and that they had scientists who had been educated here and at the top British universities. And, you know, I met people who spent time at Harvard and Stanford and, you know, and they came back and they took great pride in that in South Africa too. And then it really becomes a question. Um, I think it's possible to still be proud and to, to know that you have the ability. I mean, you can look at other countries that, that, uh, have come very close and 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 walked back their programs, right? Sweden, Argentina, Brazil. I mean, there 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 are various countries that um, you know have 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 made political decisions, but had the scientific infrastructure and, and knowledge base to get quite close. And um, so, I think as Len was saying, then it becomes an issue of intent, right? And you, perhaps it's possible to satisfy national pride um, and and still sort of not cross um, the political line of, of sort of actually instrumentalizing your, your knowledge for that purpose. So. Yeah, just one yeah. thing. My yeah. fear, I, I understand the national pride. Mm. My fear is the combination of that national fr uh, pride and Islam. Mm. Because I have experienced through my life mm. what Islam can make with the nations mm. and with the regions as we have mm. seen. I could see that 30 years yeah. ago that this is that it's going to happen. Mm. And I'm just wondering, or I'm worried about yeah. this mixture of Islam and national pride of Iranian to have them. Yeah, I mean, it's an, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I mean, this is something that was raised with Pakistan's program also. Um, and you know, whatever one thinks of the current Pakistani government, uh, Pakistan's sort of posture toward India, um, you know, there, there was also an issue of pride there. It was tremendous national pride and, you know, it's a, it's a sort of spy thriller of a story how Pakistan ob obtained its weapons. Um, but, you know, all of these nightmare scenarios that, that are always put forward about, uh, you know, the Taliban being 30 miles away from, uh, you know, most of Pakistan's nuclear arsenal. I mean, it, it hasn't happened. And I, I, I was actually there a few years ago on a trip with, with a bunch of journalists, a lot of whom were sort of uh, journalists who focus on nuclear weapons and proliferation issues. And they took us on to the, to the army base um, where the strategic command that sort of handles Pakistani nuclear strategy policy and we were given a very sort of formal briefing by um, technocrats and suits and um, you know obviously a lot of this was for show and to show the visiting Americans that we're responsible stewards but um, 
you know, we, we had a Q&A session with them and were able to ask some sort of fairly serious questions about um, security issues and strategy and, and, and these sorts of things. And, and you did come away with it, um, come away from it with a sense that like, yes, this is a highly unstable country and yes, there are people who could do terrible things if, if these weapons ever fell into their hands, but that the people who seem to be managing the program are no different than the kind of people you meet at the Pentagon. I mean, in terms of their mentality and the way that they talk and the way that they discuss, uh, and yet, you know, yes, they were Muslims too, but uh, so, you know, my sense based on looking at the Pakistani program is that if there's a threat, it's more a threat of, of sort of who's gonna get their hands on it um, and what, uh, what could then happen, and, and that was a risk with Russia too, right? After the collapse of the Soviet Union, I mean, the U.S. spent, you know, huge amounts of money trying to sort of locate and verify and, and safeguard the, the Russian arsenal in all of its, you know, uh, outlying areas, and um, and so you know, the risk was what if criminal syndicates or terrorist groups get a hold of this stuff um, less than than ideology or religion. Um, and so I, I tend to feel the same way that if, if, if the people managing the government have sort of a rational decision-making process and, and view of nuclear strategy, then, uh, then I don't see that as, as any more of a risk than in any other country. Any more questions? One more. Yeah. To me, the interesting thing about Pakistan is the role that AQ Khan mm -hmm. played. I mean, he was someone who proliferated saying yeah. uh, uh, nuclear technology to Korea, yeah. Libya, other countries, yeah. profit, profiting immensely personally, yeah. found guilty of crimes, right. and yet he's, he's still celebrated. Hero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, so, you know, the, in, in that sense, too, I mean, I should have, should have mentioned um, Khan, you know, he, he managed to get his hands on all of this information and, and sort of build the program um, by uh, spying and, and stealing technology and, and then um, despite disseminating it all over the place. Um, but it, it, it doesn't seem, if you look at, at the pattern that you're describing, that it was driven by anything other than commercial impulses, right? that, that his motivations were, were not religious and they were not ideological and, you know, he was, um, had he been selling to, uh, you know, the the local um, Taliban commanders, you know, then suddenly I, I think all of these other questions would have come into play. Are we finished or do you want to take one more? I, I don't know. I'm happy to take one more. Okay. Yeah. yeah, one more. So I understand you know, the need now for South Africa to have the bomb mm. because they were worried about an existential threat. Mm. Similarly, you've got Pakistan and India kind of buying off of one another. Mm. Sure, speculate what Iran's political motivation would be for why you know why they would get it that may not be just oh they want to drop it on somebody. But. Well, I mean, you mentioned Pakistan and India. I mean, I think Iranian military policy makers probably view Israel in much the same way that India and Pakistan view each other. Right? They see. It's very similar to Iraq, maybe, but but now with that kind of gone away from. It, I don't understand why there's as much. No, I mean, it, 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 I agree. Um, I, I mean, I'm trying to, you know, if you try to put yourself in their shoes, I mean, I think that there, there's strategic competition with Israel and with Saudi Arabia, right? And there's an issue of, of you know, who who is a regional power and there there's national pride, as you mentioned, and, and a desire to assert yourself as, as you know, a, a major regional power and, and restore your historical stature, that sort of thing. And... Um, I think there is uh, a desire to sort of um, compete with the Saudis, and then I think, at least rhetorically, there is a lot of talk about Israel, and everyone knows that Israel has a capability. And so, um, I, you know, I, I don't personally find the rationale uh, convincing in South Africa either. You know, so it, but one has to try and imagine, you know, how how these people view it, um, you know, from their from their vantage point, and I think that um, it, it, it's not always rational, right? I mean, the South African, uh, you know, you, you can be, a, I mean, they might act rationally in terms of um, decisions they make in negotiations and that sort of thing, but, um, you know, the South African 
strategy that we were talking about earlier, I mean, that wasn't particularly uh, realistic, right? I mean, the idea that, oh, you go and test a bomb over the Atlantic somewhere and suddenly the U.S. is going to send troops to Angola, I mean, that probably wouldn't have happened. Um, but the South Africans seem to seem to believe that that's what they needed to do. So, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, one can only try and look at it the way that they see it. Um, do we have time one? Or, um, yeah. Quickly. <laughs> Maybe Obama needs to offer a nuclear umbrella to Iran against Israel. And then, <laughs> you know, um, well, that probably won't happen. Yeah, I mean, if everybody that wants a deterrent, yeah. one guy did another. Yeah. 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 To well. use, if I may, to use the, the garbage from the figure from last week here, uh, that region of the world is a layered region just like any other part of the world. No. For one to respond to that concern that you had, one need to, needs to go back to 1980, the Seven Year War that took place between Iran and Iraq, and as to how it came mm -hmm. uh, to play. And then the relationships that go back to the years 1500, 1100, 1200, the regions, the animosities between Shia and Sunnis, Iranians versus Arabs, there are many, many facets in sure. this thing. Mm -hmm. It's not just the fact that Iran does not need to have it. I mean, there are so many layers that explain the complexity. Mm. And uh, to look at this picture from the vantage point of a regime that is not playing by the rules of the rest of the mm. uh, planet Earth, they would look at this picture as, I would have to survive. Mm. So if one goes back to that viewpoint, one would be able to see why it is that that enemy behaves in the manner that it does. Mm. So that's the yeah. second explanation that I can <laughs> <laughs> offer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.